We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Well, good morning, ACC. How are you guys? So I have to say, um, you know, Pastor Mike was up here and he was talking about the VIP night. And, and if you weren't here, you have to know that, you know, that cow back there, because some people have been like, what are you going to use the cow for? That cow, we had three cows up here and an almond because we had somebody who was lactose intolerant, want to take care of them, and we milked them. And I have to say, I got third place and um, I want to rematch. Okay, I was very impressed by how some of you guys were on the bowl. Uh, my, my own wife, she, she held on for dear life. And man, you guys did an amazing job. So just want to say thank you for all that you guys do. It, it seriously, it takes over 100 people to do what we do here at ACC every weekend. And so we just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for all that you do. Well, as Pastor Mike talked about, uh, we are continuing on in our series this week, God Is. And last week, Pastor Matt, he talked about how God is omniscient, that God is all-knowing. And this week, we're going to be talking about how God is omnipresent. That, and, and we'll get into that in just a moment, but let's first go to the Lord with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for how you love us. Thank you for how you are always present at all times, and that even though you know all of the things in our lives that you love us dearly, that you would even send your son to die on our behalf. Father, we ask that you would reveal yourself from heaven even more today than yesterday and the day before. Lord, that we would come to know you more fully today. Lord, I ask that you would help me to speak this message clearly and boldly. And Lord, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds and that you would move us to action. And we pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. amen, amen, amen. So last week... Uh, Pastor Matt talked about how the word omni, it means all. And so when we talk about presence, presence is to be present. So when you put omni and presence together, when God is omnipresent, it means that he is present in all places at all times. There is not one place that God is not present. Now, as we talk about this, it's important to understand that God is everywhere in his creation, But God is also distinct from His creation, okay? So everything is not God. You need to understand that as far as that, you know, some people will say, pantheism will say, God is everything and everything is God. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that God is distinct from His creation, yet He is present in all of creation. And I think that one of the ways that we can understand uh, God's omniscience, His omnipresence, that God stands outside of time, that God stands outside of space, is a glass like this. I had a friend uh, many years ago illustrate this to me, and it was so helpful. Everything in this glass, this glass, everything in it represents all of creation, all of time, all of space, all of gravity, everything in all of creation is in this. Our known universe is in here. And yet, God stands outside of it all, and yet He enters into it as well. He is distinct from it. He fills all of it. He is always present in all of it on some level or another, and yet He is also standing outside of it. Physics teaches us that space had a point when everything was created, now, or when it all began. Now, for us, we would, we would look at God's Word, and you go to Genesis 1.1, and Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He made everything at the very beginning, okay? But even in physics, they'll say, hey, there was a big bang. They may not always know what to point to to say, well, who created that bang? Who, who made it all? And within it, to understand that there are varying degrees of manifestation of His presence. It's important to understand that there are various uh, uh, distinctions. And within this, as we look at this, we can even look back to the Old Testament. There are moments in the Old Testament where God's Shekinah glory was present. 
Now, we read of this when Moses came to the burning bush. God was present in the burning bush, and he, sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. (laughs) When he went up Mount Sinai, he came down, and he had the glory of God on him, so much so that people said, whoa, you know, you, you got to veil yourself. You got to put something on there because God is present. Today, when we talk about God's presence being more present, oftentimes we might talk about revival. So, for instance, right now, many, for, for the last few decades, people have been praying for revival in the land. And some are saying that there is true revival going on at Asbury Seminary and a few other colleges. Now, we see revival taking place in people's lives all the time, but to see it on such a massive scale, it's like, wow, God is more present there than He is in some places. Now, we see that in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we see it more than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you know, God's Holy Spirit was available to prophets, priests, kings, and the occasional person. But then you go over to the New Testament, and now when Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit gets sent. And now those who follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in a believer. In fact, God is more present when the church is together because we are the temple of God today. And this leads to our first point. God is present in different ways in different places. Now, theologian Wayne Grudem, he wrote this really massive book called, it's a systematic theology book, okay? And what he talks about with God's presence is that typically uh, to be present typically means present to bless. So when God is present with His people, He is present to bless, okay? And some of the ways that we see this in Scripture, we see first and foremost in 2 Corinthians 3.17, which says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So where God is present, He is bringing freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from death, freedom from so many destructive things in this world. In John 14, 23, it says, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will be with them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now, there's a distinction made between those who know of God and those who know the living God. When, when Jesus says, hey, listen, if you invite me in, the Father and I, we're going we're to take up residence in your life. We're going to be present. We're going to be more present, present to bless. But understand that there is a distinction between those who know God and know of God. Those who know of God, we oftentimes see in the Scriptures where God speaks of being far away, distant even not present to bless necessarily, but wanting to be a blessing, wanting to bless, because ultimately the true blessing is God's presence itself. Isaiah 59, 2 says it this way, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. God wants to be present in our lives. He listens to a degree, but here's the thing. When, it's kind of like this. When my kids are upstairs, when my son is playing his guitar, whatever, and you know what? I'm yelling upstairs, Elijah, Elijah, Elijah. He can't can't hear me whatsoever. And guess what? In the midst of it, he starts yelling down, dad, dad, dad. And I'm like, I can't hear you. There's too much noise going on. And so sometimes our lives are so full of noise that from all the sin and everything in our lives that God can't hear. Proverbs 15, 29 says it this way, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. And so God is everywhere in his creation, but he is distinct from his creation. He is all present. And one of the things that I love, I love to have examples of this and And as I was putting this uh, message together, the best example that I could see was something along these lines. Okay, so this, this, uh, this sponge here, this symbolizes creation. This, this symbolizes your life. Now, I have to admit, there's a little bit of moisture, but I haven't put anything in here. Okay, and yet this water right here, this water, 
It symbolizes God's holy presence, okay? Now, when we look at God's holy presence in our lives, it's important to understand that the presence of God is always available because God is all places at all times. Think about that for a moment. When we, when we think of the universe, the universe has gotten larger in our minds over the years. You have to think at one time, they believed that we just had the solar system. And then a monk said, had a dream, I think it was from the Lord, and this monk said, he came to a revelation that ultimately if there's a wall, then there's usually something on the other side of the wall and realize the universe is much larger. Now, I remember in sixth grade, the Hubble Space Telescope went up into space and we saw images. We saw that our universe is much larger than we thought. And then just recently, the James Webb Telescope went up and scientists are like, it's a lot bigger than we thought. There's a lot more. If I were to put an image, it would look like a whole bunch of stars up here. But each star would be a galaxy. And I'm willing to bet that, you know, in the next 50 years, there's going to be another telescope that's going to go up. And they're going to be like, it's even bigger than we thought. I've oftentimes wondered at the, what happens when you get to the end of the universe because it's not infinite. And the only thing that I can think is when you get to the end, you've, it's God. But I think that God is just as present on the outskirts of the universe as He is right here in our lives and available to us. And so this symbolizes our lives. And you've got to think in terms of the creation. Think about it at the very beginning of creation. This water symbolizes the Holy Spirit, and this sponge is creation. It's our lives. And man, it's just dripping with the presence of God. It's everywhere. This is like when God was walking in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, and He was just there. He was there with Adam, naming all the animals and everything. He was completely present. They just, everything. But then, one day, sin entered the world, and you know, it become, became very dry, much drier than it had ever been, where, you know, I can come over here and Maybe there's a little bit, but there's not a whole lot there. There's not as much as there once was. And yet God comes into the world. He's not just a cosmic watchmaker who just created the universe and just set it into being. Instead, He is present with His creation. He is omnipresent. He is present in all places at all times. But there may be more presence than at other times. Sometimes it's like, man, God is just, oh man, I was in this prayer time and God was so present and I could, I could just feel Him in the room. But then there are other times where we just feel like, God, where are you? Where are you? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But I love what Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 23 and 24 says. We're told, God says, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Who can, hide in, who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. You see, there's not a place that God isn't. This leads to our second point, and that is God is always available. God is always available. Now, understand the Israelites were getting ready to go to Babylon. They were, God was basically sending them into exile. And when they were going to be going into Babylon, God is basically saying, listen, am I only near? No, I'll be there with you. I'm going to be there. Now, when we talk about the Bible, when we look at uh, things like monotheism, maybe you've heard of. Monotheism is the belief in only one God. And then there's polytheism. You've probably also heard of that. And the Israelites, they struggled with polytheism, the belief in many different gods. But there's also a third category. And that third category is called henotheism. Henotheism says, well, you know, there's many gods, but this one is mine. When we look at Moses, when he interacts with God at the burning bush, at the burning bush, God says, I want to send you into Egypt. I know that you came from Egypt. I'm sending you back there. And in the midst of this conversation, Moses asks a simple question. Who should I say sent me? 
Like, of all the gods, which one should I say sent me? And God says, I am. I exist. Inferring I'm the only one. And yet, within it, the Israelites, they struggled with this at times because henotheism says, there are many gods, but this one is mine. So, we would see gods at war throughout the ages. Maybe a a good way to understand this is, for instance, we are in the midst of spring training, are we not? Baseball season is amongst us. And who is our team? The O's, the Baltimore Orioles, right? I don't know what that other one was. (laughs) But, But here's the thing. We live just outside of Baltimore, Baltimore, right? We're just outside Baltimore. And so the O's are our team. And we would say, yeah, there's Yankees. Uh, there's, 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 there's the Detroit Tigers. There's the Boston Red Sox. We have all these different teams, but those are their teams. We know who our team is, okay? We know who our team is. There are many teams, but this one is mine. And for the Israelites... They had to come to an understanding, a greater understanding over time to understand that there are no other gods, there is only one God. This is one of the reasons that they kept on falling into polytheism as well. We read in Deuteronomy 4.7, what other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to Him? Those other gods are not close the way that Yahweh is. But Yahweh was the only one who really existed. 1 Kings 8.27, I'm going to read this in a moment, but I want to give a little bit of background. You have to think about the fact that God had made His presence. He's omnipresent. He's all places, and He's on the other side of the universe, and yet He chooses to be with humanity. He chooses to take His presence and reside in a tent, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle. And one day, David looks and he says, man, I've got, I've got a, a hopping place over here. You're still in a tent, God. You need something better. I want to build you a temple. And God says, I'd love for you to do that, but David, you have too much blood on your hands. But here's what you can do, David. You can prepare the way for your son to build everything. So you can get all the supplies and everything together. And Solomon, in his day, he builds the temple in Jerusalem. But there's a question. Will God's presence fill the temple? Just because He creates it does not mean that God is going to come there. And I love what Solomon says here in 1 Kings 8, 27. He says, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Now, the story goes on and we find that God does, in fact, fill the temple with His glory. But sometimes, sometimes we can put God in a box, can't we? We can put God in a box where, you know, in the book of Ezekiel, God's saying, hey, you're going to be going to Babylon. And you hear people say, but the temple, the temple. Inferring, listen, we have God literally in a box, this temple, and so we have God. We have possession of God, is what they're really saying. Their God was too small. Their God was too small. I would say for each one of us, God is too small. Because God is greater than anything that we could ever imagine. If we could really take a moment, if we could truly wrap our minds and our hearts around God's omniscience, God's omnipresence, how magnificent He is, how He stands outside of space and time and everything that we know, and yet He also enters into it. The writer of Hebrews, speaking of creation, says this, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. Paul, an early follower of Jesus, he says in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold 
together. All things hold together. When I read these things, I think about the fact that Isaiah tells us, before me, God says, before me there were no gods, neither shall there be after. There is only one God and He's created all of it and He's present in all of it, yet distinct from the creation. And yet, he says, I hold it all together. If you hold it all together, somehow or another, you have to be present, don't you? God is present, holding all the universe, everything that we know together. And yet, it's as if if he just walked away. We would just cease to exist. None of us would exist, and we wouldn't even know it. And for some of you, if you are, if you've watched some Marvel movies, you know, just imagine Thanos in that moment, okay? If you don't know this, bear with me. But Thanos, he has the five stones and he basically goes like this. He just clicks his fingers and half of all created beings cease to be in an instance. God couldn't ultimately just do this and none of us, nothing in all of creation would exist, and yet He holds it together. The mere fact that He holds it together shows His omnipresence. The further out we get, the more we see how magnificent God is. And it's important to understand that as we talk about His omnipresence, this leads to our third point, God is always listening. Because God is always present, God is always listening. Now, for some of us, you might be like, I don't know about that. That kind of freaks me out a little. Like God's always there? Yeah, He's always there. But understand, we see some things in Scripture that should really, really give us some comfort. One of those things we see in Psalm 145, verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. Like, it's not just one of those things of, well, God, you know, I hope that you do this. No, like, we really are calling out to Him. And the psalmist, oftentimes, when you read through the psalms, the psalmist is saying, God, where are you? Where are you? Nevertheless, I will trust you. It's important to understand that He is present at all times and in all circumstances. In fact, when we come to Genesis chapter 16, we, we read the story of how Abraham... God had called Abraham to be the father of many nations, to go to the promised land, to go to a place that he had never been, and God says, listen, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And he's an old man. I mean, he's like really, really old. He's in his 80s, 90s, and up, and he's sitting there going, I don't have any kids, Lord. And my wife, Sarai, she's not any younger than I am. We're getting up there. Things don't happen like this. And Sarai says, hey, Abram, why don't you take my servant Hagar and you can have kids with her? And so Abram does this. In fact, this is not in God's will, but he does it. And then Hagar becomes pregnant. And Hagar as a servant becomes maybe a little bit overly confident. I don't know exactly what it looked like, but I know that Sarai was getting upset and at the end of the day, Hagar runs away. She, she actually is kicked out. She runs away. And in the midst of this, here's a pregnant woman. And she doesn't have any hope. She doesn't have a future. And it says that the angel of the Lord showed up. And when the angel of the Lord showed up, he says, name him Ishmael, which means God hears. God hears. I would say within that, I don't know if he, she had a, a literal talking out or if it was her heart, but God certainly heard what was going on. And he says, go back, go back, and I'm going to bless you. See, God was present to bless. And then she says this in Genesis 16, verse 13. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have seen the one who sees me me. He says, name him God hears. And then she says, not only does he hear, he sees me. He sees me and he sees each and every single one of us when we are struggling, when there is difficulty in life, whatever it is that you're going through, God sees you and God hears you when you're calling out to him. 
it's important to understand that God's omnipresence isn't just on the other side of the universe. It's everywhere that you are. It's in the pain. It's in the suffering. It's in the difficulty. It's in the temptations. It's in all of it. All the human experience. And He is not a far-off God. It says that Jesus, God incarnate, walked amongst us, and He was tempted in every way the way that you and I were tempted. Now, it may not be the exact thing, but temptation, listen, I will never look down at you because you don't struggle with the things that I struggle with. So I would hope that you never look down at me or anyone else because we don't struggle with what you struggle with. God says, listen, I've been, Jesus was tempted in every way yet without sin. That's the distinction. Sometimes we kind of struggle, don't we? We struggle to, with God's presence. We're like, yeah, I wish I remember a time when God was present. But I got to tell you, John, the circumstances I'm going through right now, it's really difficult. I'm really struggling. There was a time when, man, I was, His presence was there. But you know what? Right now, I'm feeling kind of dry. Things aren't really going on right now, and there's just not a whole lot. And you need to know that God is still present. Maybe, like you, maybe it wasn't, isn't like it was, but He is still present. And even in those moments where you may be in the midst of a spiritual desert, feeling alone or lonely, maybe in the midst of a crowd and feeling lonely, we read in Psalm 121, it says, The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. And if you're wondering how close God's presence is, you ever been in the midst of the sun and you didn't have your sunglasses and you're just, the sun's just beating down on you? And you're like, man, I wish I had some shade. God says, I'm as close as the closest shade that you'll ever have. I'm as close as the shade of your right hand. Put the, you just take and put that there and suddenly you're a little bit more okay. He's as close as the shade of your right hand. And if you continue, if you continue to walk with Him, I guarantee you, His presence will show up more and more as you walk with Him each day. Because at the end of the day, God may be silent, but not absent. There may be moments that, he feel, that it feels like He's silent, like, God, where are you? Silent but not absent. Always available, as close as the shade of your right hand, the psalmist says. And so this morning, I want to I give you five things that God's omnipotence, on, omnipresence, I'm sorry, God's omnipresence changes. The first one is courage. You're in a situation, you're not quite certain what to do. Maybe you're like getting in the book of Judges, and God is showing up and calling you mighty warrior, and you're like, mighty warrior? I don't know what you're, who you're looking at. If we recognize that God is present, truly present, it should help us to have the courage that maybe we didn't have a moment ago. The second thing that God's omnipresence changes is comfort. Because we are not alone, knowing that the Holy Spirit, Jesus went to the Father in order that the Holy Spirit come, could come to the earth, that the Holy Spirit could take up the residence within the life of every believer. In fact, the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. And understanding that, you know, Paul wrote a letter to the church in Thessalonica and said, we do not grieve as those who are without hope. We have comfort from the Holy Spirit. We don't have to go through, through death, tragedy, difficulty, any of these things alone. He will comfort us in our sorrows. The third thing that God's omnipresence changes is cooperation. God's in it to win it. We oftentimes may feel like, well, if I go there to where God is calling me to go, I'm going to have to start everything up. No, 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 no. God was already present there working upstream. When we join God in what He's doing, we'll find that, guess what? God was already working in the lives of other people. You were created at a particular time and in a particular place with a particular purpose in order that you would know Him. And we're told in the book of Ephesians that He's created good works in advance for us to do. And so if He's created those things in advance, then when we get there, whatever it is, there's some cooperation with God. 
the fourth thing that we find is a commitment. You might feel alone at times. But we're told in God's Word, He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He's faithful to to finish that good work that He began. He's going to finish it all the way to the end. And, And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes difficulties, sin, temptation, all those things, it can kind of bog us down. And it's like, God, are are, are you still committed to me? Are, are you still here? And yes, He is. He is working in the lives of those who have called upon His name. Who have called upon His name. But don't think that just because you, maybe you're here for the first time and you're like, you know, I'm not sure what I think about God. I'm not sure about this Jesus character. This is the fifth thing that God's omnipresence changes. It's consistency. It's consistency. See, you may have come to the church for the very first time. This may be one of those conversations that you've not really known too much, but I need you to know something very clearly. From the moment that you were created, the moment that you were born in this world, God has been seeking to get your attention right up until this very moment. And if nobody has ever said it to you, I want you to hear clearly that God has a purpose and a plan for your life. That he sent his son to die for your sins. In your, he took your place on the cross in order that you could also have eternal life. That you could have a relationship with God. That you could have forgiveness of sins. That you don't have to walk in that life any longer. That you can have a hope. That you can have comfort. That you can have all those things. But here's the deal. And as much as he consistently has been trying to get your attention up into this moment, I promise you, to the day that you go to the grave, he will continue to seek to get your attention because he wants not just today and tomorrow and the next day with you, he wants all of eternity with you. And here's the thing, if you think that eternity is just simply some, you know, wings and harps, first, we don't get wings, we don't become angels, we don't. We were made in God's image, something very distinct for humanity. We don't get any harps, but I hear that there's some amazing music in heaven, okay? I'm hoping that there's some amps and stuff like that. But along the way, understand that God is consistently going to continue to try to get your attention up until that day because he wants an eternity with you. But if you choose to say, you know what, I don't want that, he'll honor that. And you don't want that other side. You don't want it. And it can be as simple as a prayer like this. One of my mentors said many years ago when he was in solitary confinement in jail, he cried out to God and said, God, I don't believe in you, but if you're real, I need you. And that was the beginning of his relationship with God. And he found Jesus. He found that everything in here is true. So this week when we talk about what now, God, we want to, we want to, where do I go with this, John? Where, where does God want us to go? Well, the first one I would say is this, call on him. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ already, call on him, pray, 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 pray without ceasing. Whether something good is happening or something bad is happening, bring it to God because he wants to walk with you through it all. Second thing is call out to him. Again, if you've never called upon the name of the Lord, if you've never called out and said, I want to accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, make today that day. Just simply say, God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. And he will make it real. I guarantee you. And he will reveal himself through his word more and more in your life. And that leads to our third point. Here is calling on your life. Every single one of us whether here in person, in the lounge, or online, God has a calling on your life. There's no question in my mind of this. He has a calling and a purpose on your life. It's time to act courageously and step out into new areas, to start that business that you never imagined that you would, to begin to pray prayers that only God, only God could fulfill. 
whatever that is, whether it's healing, or maybe a child, I don't know what it is, a marriage that's been tumultuous and it needs restoration, God will meet you right where you're at. Let's pray. Father, you are an omnipresent God. You are just as present on the other side of creation as you are right here, Lord. And maybe even more here, Lord, because you are present to bless. Father, we ask that you would reveal yourself more and more in our lives. Help us to hear your voice clearly because you are a God who hears and you are a God who sees us. Help us to see you in all of your glory more and more each day. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. And everyone said, amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.